right, thank you for turning up this early in the morning. Um, hopefully it's going to be worth it. I'm going to go through the presentation here, and there's nothing that says what VR and AR can accomplish rather than showing what we've actually accomplished so far and what we think the view of the future is going to be. So I'm going to come up with some salient points and things that we've been doing as Dell through the last, what, 12, 18 months, uh, and then where we think the future of immersive design is going to go. Uh, I'm going to try desperately not to make this sound like a sales pitch, so please stop me if uh, you think I'm trying to sell to you. But this is really to show what we're doing differently in the industry, what we're investing in, how we're going to make AR and VR easier to adopt inside the industry as well. But first off, it's always a good idea to level set. Because if I hear people say that AR and VR is the, the Wild West one more time, I'm probably going to scream. I, but we need to set a level where we're all on the same page. We all understand what we mean by the terminologies. So we hear about mixed reality. Mixed reality, creating the objects in a space, being able to all view it collaboratively, be able to walk around that object as if it's actually in the room. Where it all started was at 360 video, which I now call the gateway to VR. Single point in space, single camera, you hold it up, you can then do that 360 video, but if you walk around inside of that image, then everything moves relative to where you are because you're at that camera point. It's not fully immersive. However, we're now starting to see techniques in 360 video which are really increasing the benefits of it. We can start using photogrammetry so we can start doing different angles inside of uh, rooms and objects. We can also now start doing volumetric where you actually can see volume and space and parallax when you move around inside a 360 video. Um, as I'm fond of saying, the, the one year in VR and AR is like a dog year. There's seven years of technology that are crammed into one year, and the rate of progression is, act, is absolutely fantastic. The innovation that's coming, what you're seeing in the room here with VR and AR, really pushing that envelope. Every day I wake up, something new has changed. It's really difficult to try and keep up with all those technologies. But then we move into virtual reality. Virtual reality is the six degrees of freedom, completely computer generated. Nothing from the outside world. The computer is in control of what you see. So that's when we go into the VR space. Augmented reality would be incredibly handy for me up here right now, where if I was wearing a pair of AR specs, hopefully they're going to come down in size over the, uh, the next few iterations. But then I can look out into the room, facial recognition. I'm going to start seeing your names. I'm going to be able to interact with you in a more personal way. Might even get some snippets from your favorite social network that will actually tell me your likes and dislikes, so I can actually target some of the comments and some of the anecdotes towards you, making you more involved. So AR is going to be really huge in terms of interactions, personal interactions, and moreover business. And we'll see some more of that later, of how the commercial aspects of AR are really taking off. So if we look at why do I care? Right? Inside of Dell, why do we care about AR and VR, and why do we think it's going to be big? You always have the people that say, oh, it's going to be the next 3D TV. Right? It's a flash in the pan. VR is never going to take off. Well, if we look at where it is, then 3D TV didn't really take off because you had to wear, you had to wear glasses. Uh, you were isolated from everybody else. Uh, there were different standards around that didn't act. Oh, hang on. That's VR. No, it was the content. That was it. So it's the content that's different. So we've now got content that we can consume. Commercial have really taken the baton with VR. If you think where it came from, it's actually a consumer product. It's for a pr prosumer. It was designed to hit a pr price point for a pro gamer, prosumer, home user. But the thing was that it was the first time that VR became truly accessible. The businesses picked that up and said, what can we do with that? How can we make life better? AR is now coming along. And again, another comment is that, is AR going to replace VR? So do I need to do VR now, or do I just hop straight into AR? If you look at these figures here, so the obligatory graph, we're going to see by 2021 that AR is really going to start to surpass VR inside of business. However, there's still a place for both. It depends on the usage model that you want to do. VR, very, very immersive. Augmented reality, I'm looking at things. I can see the outside world as well. So imagine uh, how many of you actually use YouTube videos at home. You've got your laptop next to you. You're taking apart the dishwasher. You're taking apart the washing machine, hopefully putting it back together again successfully as well. But you're actually looking at the YouTube video, and then you look at the machine. 
Imagine now that you're doing that in an industrial setting, you're now looking through AR, and it's telling you what to replace. Imagine assisted learning, where you've got somebody who's learning the job on the, on the street, and then you've got the expert back in the office that's guiding them through with AR. So there's different usage models for both VR and for AR. It really depends on the context. And again, they're like two bus stops on the same journey. So one doesn't replace the other. In terms of use cases, we split up our industries into verticals. So the verticals, oil and gas, media and entertainment, et cetera, et cetera. Every single vertical has a use case for VR and AR. Right, whether that be through training or whatever else. I used to facetiously say, well, it would be quicker to actually list the industries where you can't use VR. And then I used to say, like, underwater. However, there's a startup now that's doing VR underwater. So I can't say that anymore. So literally, there are instances where you use VR and AR technology in every single instance. Uh, the easiest ones to do are like training and simulation. We've seen a few examples of that already. Um, but you know, I used to think that to train an oil rig worker, you put everybody on a bus, you send them off to the oil rig, six months later, anybody who's still alive gets the job. Right? Now we can actually train people up in the safety of VR, in the safety of the VR and the AR environments. We can introduce real objects into the world so we can train muscle memory. So again, in a training simulation, if you're training an oil rig worker to turn off a valve, how do you know how much force is in that valve? You don't want them running up to the valve in real life, trying to shut down the, the situation that's occurred, and then trying to frantically wave their Vive controllers above it, wondering why nothing's happened. We can actually introduce a valve into the training. They know how much torque, how much force it needs to actually train that, even though they're still in that VR environment. So it's becoming very, very powerful as a tool to train people in safe environments and controlled environments. There's a couple of examples that we've seen out there. Um, you know, even Walmart are now putting all of their employees through 360 video training of how to deal with situations. The, the usage models are absolutely endless. So what have we done to actually drive VR? Again, it's, there's nothing that proves how VR can be used or AR can be used than real-life examples. So last um, November, so literally a year ago this month, uh, Jaguar Land Rover launched the iPace electric SUV. They wanted to do something different. They wanted to do something different with the design. They wanted to do something different that was innovative, that really showed that an electric car was really pushing the boundaries. So let's push the boundaries on everything. We had a, a VR launch right, with uh, Jaguar Land Rover where 56 people in LA and 10 people over in London were all in the same VR experience. The black screen video of the engineers was held above the earth. The model of the Jaguar uh, I-Pace was actually in the corner. And each individual person could have their own individual experience with the car. They could zoom into the suspension. They could take the, um, the chassis apart. They could look at the wheels and, uh, and look at fuel consumption. And all of the blurb coming from the engineers supplemented that. You saw fuel range, or the range of the vehicle, rather, as down the edge of California. How far can you drive on one single charge? So it really brought it alive, and everybody loved the fact that they were using VR to launch it in a new way. Uh, the tech reporters were there. The automotive reporters were there. They said this is going to change the way that products are going to get launched. Now, the other thing was that they actually used VR during the design process as well. So they had their interior and exterior design engineers, for instance, looking at models of the car, looking inside of it, seeing where they could route the cables inside of the vehicle, and then making changes to the vehicle inside of VR to see how they could best use that space. They then did VR simulation of a wind tunnel right, on those changes so they could see the drag coefficients. So VR was used extensively during the design and build process, which again is a great testament to how VR is really changing the industry. So that was one example. People do one-ofs all the time and sort of say, oh, yeah, we tried that, but it didn't really work for us. But how can you prove that something was a success? You do it again. So they had an e-pace launch in the middle of this year, which, again, we were involved with, again using VR. Uh, just as a side note, they uh, also got the Guinness World Record for the, uh, for the longest barrel roll in, a, in an SUV. Right? So that was done live inside of the hangar. Um, the, the press that were there, again, had another VR experience, uh, more of the specs of the car, uh, and they actually saw the barrel roll inside of VR, so they experienced it from the car's perspective. They then took off the headset, then they saw the barrel roll being done in real life, 
Okay, so again, very, very impactful. Incidentally, on the iPACE one, uh, the great thing about VR, you know, we've seen some conferences where people are putting VR headsets, people can walk past everybody without being noticed. While the reporters were actually having their VR experience and the engineers for the iPACE launch, they were actually wheeling in the car in the background that nobody could see, so that when everybody took their headset off, all the lights come up, the music starts, then you've got this concept car in the middle of the room, which everybody could then see in real life. So again, VR is giving you that emotional connection right, and that experience uh, of the car launch that you wouldn't otherwise have got. So again, a great experience there. So two examples with Jaguar Land Rover there. So what are we doing differently? How can we help VR adoption, as Dell, to, to help our customers and, and help our base to really embrace VR and AR with no expense? Because as has been said in the, in the previous presentations, to actually model things, get things in, does become a very expensive and time-consuming process. So first off, what we do is like, okay, what do we mean by a VR-ready system? So we've come up with the concept of a ready for VR. Because you're going to see individual graphics cards that say VR ready. You're going to see headsets that say certified and whatever else. But how can you as a customer know that what you're buying is going to be good enough for the job? So what we've done is we've actually certified the whole system as ready for VR. So on the web page, you'll see something with a nice little logo that will say, yep, this will run VR. This will run it at 90 frames per second. This isn't going to cause you to lose your lunch. Okay, because you don't want to take that, that guess that you're getting the right system. Uh, the other thing that we've done, which uh, we feel is different, is that we actually sit an engineer inside a headset for about 30 to 45 minutes to actually do a full perception test. Because even if you benchmark something, that still might gloss over some jitter. Right? You might suddenly have some starter in the middle, and that won't be noticeable to the benchmark program. And so it comes out the end and says, oh, yeah, this is the X number of units of performance that you've got inside of VR. You're good to go. Then you might notice that in higher complex models that you get some jitter, and then that causes the, the brain to, to suddenly go and say, mm, OK, something's not right. So again, the perception test is a very important part of that. We also have VR centers of excellence. We've got uh, eight around the world. We've got two in the US, one in Austin, one in Santa Clara, and there'll be more opening up over the years as we go forward. What this does is this allows you to come in and try VR with like absolutely no cost to you. So rather than buying a load of systems and a load of graphics cards, then getting your models, then seeing how it works inside of VR, you can actually bring it into us. You can talk to our experts there, load it onto the system, load it onto different sizes of system. As I say, just book it through uh, the normal sales channel in, with your account manager or whatever, and you can then use all of that equipment. You can even go into it remotely. Probably not a good idea with VR, right? But you know, we can actually do that on site, help you through it. And we think that's a great value because, again, it's reducing the time to acceptance of VR inside your industries. We then also have the technology partner program. Uh, if I have one more email that comes into my inbox that says I'm a world leader in VR and AR, um, then again, I'm going to scream. I scream quite a lot, apparently. Um, so in terms of this, then we're acting, and people don't like me saying it back at base, but I'm going to say it anyway, we're like the dating agency right, inside of this. So we're taking in what we think are the, are the world leaders in their particular space. We try it out on the Dell hardware, make sure it does what it says on the tin. I, and then we present those inside the VR centers of excellence. So if we have a customer that comes in with a particular vertical, particular need, we have partners in various areas that we've already certified in there, and we can play that, that dating game and like, match people up. So again, I work in it 24-7. Right, for VR and AR. And even I have difficulty keeping up with all the changes and all the moves that are happening in the industry. Right? If you're wearing one hat that says, oh, I'm doing VR and AR for my organization, and your other hat is like your uh, IT manager for a team, and then you've got to manage people and everything else, that's a huge draw on your time. Whereas I'm doing this all the time, and we can take that difficulty out and help you make those, those links and changes. We're also seeing a lot of um, gamification. So we're all like seeing VR as being shooting zombies or watching 360 videos. It goes a lot further than that. How many of you know about the Ghostbusters experience in New York? All right, a couple of you. So inside of Madame Tussauds, there's a Ghostbusters VR experience. They'll, I'll 
come into the relevance of that in a moment. But you go in there, you wear a backpack, you wear a haptic vest, you actually see a Victorian mansion as you're going around. But it's actually modelled in plywood and everything else as you're going through. So if you reach out and touch a door handle, there's a real door handle there. There'll be heat sources which actually go and say, this is a real heat source. There'll be fans which are blowing up air to say, this is a drop, this is a chasm. So you actually feel the wind. So you're fully immersed by your senses inside of VR. Taking that technology, now imagine using that in training firefighters. So you can actually build a building out of plywood, you can put firefighters inside of it, you can do simulated fires, you can do simulated heat sources. We're taking all of the techniques we're seeing inside of games and location-based experiences, and they have real-world uses of how can we train people more effectively in real life. And that's where it becomes really, really exciting because we can immerse people, and media and entertainment are always pushing that envelope. They want the next big thing, they want the next thrill rush, but it has serious, serious usage models inside of industry. So the other thing is, what about the future? The future we see is like the immersive design. I'm going to show you a quick video now, and this is basically going to show you what we feel we can take the technology of immersion, a do surface, uh, AR inside of that design, and it was done with our partners Nike, Meta, and Ultra Haptics. So take a look at this video. There's some marketing license in there, I'll grant you, but all of the technology you're gonna see It starts with a question. Load women size eight. Followed by an idea on how to make things simpler better or more beautiful approximate shape from sketches but it's not just what it looks like road cross terrain sequence it's how it works which means trying and failing and trying again. To be a designer means not being bound by the limits of your tools, but instead, expand box, being inspired by them. Show me the upper. So that you can focus on what only you can do. Being creative. Being curious. And being critical. Exploring the union between function and form. Until suddenly you know. Optimize cushion pattern for terrain. That's it. And when you're ready to share your work, make sure everyone can see that the world is a little simpler, better, and more beautiful. Fantastic. And so, as I say, all of that exists today in a lab, okay? So we're just on the cusp of that starting to become a design reality. And with that, I'll say thank you very much.